In this lecture, we will talk about nephrolithiasis, also known as kidney stones. Kidney stones form when calcium, oxalate, and other compounds reach abnormally high concentrations in the urine. So it is caused by the imbalance between solubility and precipitation of mineral salts within the urine. We have found certain factors that can favor stone development. For example, abnormal urine flow, whether it's caused by the kidney stone itself or enlarged prostate for male patients or cancer, for example, in the urinary bladder, um, or as we mentioned, when the urine composition becomes abnormal. Hydration status is also very important. As we will see later on, for people with kidney stones, adequate fluid intake, especially of water, is essential for management or prevention of future episodes. Low urinary pH has also been shown to favor uric acid and cysteine stone development. During acute attacks of kidney stones, it is a very painful experience for the patients because when a stone gets stuck, for example, if it's stuck in the ureter, they will have severe lower back pain. And sometimes people may even have red blood cells appear in the urine because the stone is stuck and it's literally hurting the soft tissue, so causing damage there. But despite of this, most of the stones can be passed with plenty of fluid and medication. Sometimes the physicians also give patients shots that loosen the smooth muscle in the urinary system because that way it can enlarge the diameter. For example, enlarging the diameter of the ureter and that would allow the stone to travel through um, rather than to continue to be stuck there. However, in certain cases, we have to do more than just medication and fluid intake. For example, we have this ESWL technology where without doing any surgery, we can apply a shock wave from outside the patient's body and break down a big stone and make it small enough so that the pieces can be passed through with normal urine flow. So obviously to conduct this procedure, we rely on medical imaging to accurately locate where the stone is exactly so that we can precisely direct the wave towards the target. Unfortunately, during acute episodes of kidney stone attacks, there's really very little a dietitian can do, if anything at all. However, for people who have a history of kidney stone episodes, there's a lot that RDs can do in order to manage the condition and prevent it from happening again. So during the nutrition assessment, dietitians should focus on factors related to stone development. For example, we already mentioned a few factors such as hydration status, urinary pH value, and the flow of urine itself. It has been shown that diets with high intake of animal proteins and at the same time with low intakes of fruit and vegetables, these diets are connected with more acidic urine. And we mentioned acidic urine particularly favors the development of a certain type of kidney stone. Therefore, this diet, this kind of diet increases the risk for stone formation. And if we pause a second to think about the features of the diet, so um, high in intake of animal proteins and low intakes of fruit and vegetables. So if we do see something like this, one thing we could do to improve the overall quality of the diet is to increase fruits and vegetables and reduce animal protein intake. This actually leads us to a point where if we have a generally healthful diet, really that itself could reduce the risk because generally healthful diets will have a good amount of intake of fruits and vegetables and will also have a reasonable amount of animal protein intake, but not too much. 
So just by asking patients to eat healthier in general, this may already be an effective way to manage their condition. Nutrition diagnosis for kidney stones could be excessive mineral intake, inadequate fluid intake, which makes sense if we think about the etiology, right? So abnormally high concentrations of certain minerals or inadequate urine, in, urine flow or hydration status. Other diagnosis could be food and nutrition knowledge deficit. For example, uh, we just mentioned that the overall features of diets that are associated with kidney stone development. So if the patient doesn't know this, then obviously that would be a nutrition education topic and we could say that they are deficit in this aspect of knowledge. So some key intervention strategies for kidney stones. Um, we need to increase fluid intake because that will in turn increase urinary flow and that can achieve two things. One, the flow itself could get rid of smaller pieces and two, with increased urine formation, it can dilute the concentration of whatever um, minerals are an issue here. So that itself could decrease the precipitation of the stones. And the increase of fluid intake should be three liters per day and divided in different doses. And at least half of the increase in fluid should be delivered by water, not other beverages. It should be water. No evidence indicates limiting dairy products can help manage kidney stones. Therefore, there's no need for patients to limit their dairy intake. You know, this may seem a little counterintuitive because we know milk and milk products are high in calcium and calcium precipitation is a major type of kidney stone. But again, evidence does not show benefits for kidney stones by limiting dairy products. And if the patient takes a vitamin C supplement, we should not be taking more than 200 milligrams per day. So that's already 200% of the recommended intake level. And we know vitamin C is ascorbic acid, therefore intact vitamin C in the urine could reduce the pH value, which again favors stone development. We also uh, mentioned another group of compounds called uh, oxalate. Uh, so it could be calcium oxalate, which is one type of salt, and high oxalate definitely is associated with kidney stones. Certain studies indicate that if a patient uh, uses probiotics, then dietary oxalate could be broken down in the intestine before they are absorbed into the blood. So that could help reduce the amount of oxalate in the system. And if we're talking about high purine food, so again, we, a lot of the sources of animal protein are also high in purines. And we know purine through metabolism could increase uric acid production. So this is the same uric acid that's indicated in gout attack. So the patient could be experiencing very bad pain around large joints, and this is the gout that's related to the uric acid precipitation around those joints. But in this case, uric acid can form stones in the urinary system, which is also painful. So in this case, we should limit the patient's intake of high purine foods. And... Um, What's good is the purine content of different foods is pretty well known. A lot of facilities, including nutrition care menu online, have such lists so they can easily be handed out to patients as education material. This table from the textbook nicely summarizes nutrition therapy strategies and goals that target risk factors for kidney stones. As we mentioned earlier, the value of dietitian services for kidney stone patients is not when they're having a acute attack. Um, so when they have some history and they want to prevent future attacks, 
that would be when we come into play. During the acute attack, again, there's little RDs can do at the moment. It's more the physician's job to alleviate the pain or use shockwave therapy to strike it into smaller pieces. So please review this slide and the next one and pay attention to the relationship goals between different factors to specific goals and the MNT strategy. Uh, for example, this uh, hyperoxaluria. So that refers to too much oxalate in the urine. And we do know that too much oxalate could lead to kidney stones. So what can we do? Well, here are our goals. So we want to enhance the GI bonding, binding potential for our oxalate. And this would decrease the absorption of oxalate and make sure it doesn't, too much doesn't show up in the system. We can do this by increasing calcium intake with meals. And we know that certain vegetables Green vegetables are high in oxalate, so if we have a high intake of calcium with these meals, with the green vegetables, then the oxalate and calcium can bind, and that could precipitate in the GI. Therefore, neither would be absorbed into the bloodstream, so we wouldn't have to worry about too much oxalate in the urine. So this is the mechanism we're talking about. I encourage you to please read this table carefully. Um, the mechanisms by now should be pretty obvious so we can understand why we're doing this to achieve these specific goals.